Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 87. Science Faction Frankie M. Frankie, does, is it named after comedy show sensation? Frankie Muniz. It is. It's also a highly radioactive metal that decays into astatine, one of our favorites, Hell radium, yeah. and radon, which we just uh, found out about recently. Bulk Frankium has never been viewed because of the general appearance of other elements in its periodic table column. So basically, it groups together with other stuff so much, we've never been able to isolate it by itself and look at it. So it's uh, essentially it's kind of like Invisible Girl. Yeah. It remains impervious for our to our investigation. I was kind of picturing Batman in my head, like somebody who uh, the cops and criminals all want to know who Batman is. Let's isolate Batman and get that mask off him, off Frankium. But <laughs> it was the last element discovered in nature rather than by synthesis. So similarly, it would be the last natural superhero before cosmic rays created the Fantastic Four. So it is a lot like Batman. We're like natural superheroes. You're the ones that don't have powers. Like uh, Batman. Yeah, Batman. Basically just Batman. He's, <laughs> he's, the, he's the non-GMO superhero. All right. <laughs> I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my other comedian, Mr. Damien Ricardo. Damien, how are you doing tonight? Doing great. Uh, great Batman joke at the end there. Right? <laughs> Hats off to you. And our uh, guest host today is none other than Manish Gupta. You are also a scientist and a comedian as well, aren't yes, you, Manish? Yes, I am. Yeah. Oh, he's try- Thanks for having me here. Of course. Thanks. He's trying to work in on my <laughs> on my gig. He's one of the few. <laughs> Listen, I, yeah, there I are did, many few of us. There are many few. No, I did, I, my Joel was not to be the best comedian. I was just going to pick a niche that no one else wanted to do. And by you trying to get in on my science comedy, you're really stepping on my toes here, Manish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you are far way ahead of me to reach up to you, you know? There, there you go. That's right. I do have I a... You cannot see me on radio, but... Manish and I actually met doing a show together, which I would describe as the show where two people who never looked more physically different on <laughs> Earth did a show. Uh, Manish, you are a, a gentleman of slighter stature than myself. Yes, Was that, is that fair to say? Yes, it is. It is. As people who can hear you can tell, uh, you are, of course, of South American origin. <laughs> yes, I am. I yeah. am. Brazilians are dicks. <laughs> I'm not going to fight this dude outside. But I will take that. I will take that. I've gotten Brazilian, (laughs) Spanish, uh, like if I'm near a car service garage, Mexicans. (laughs) (laughs) I like how people hear you and still think you're Brazilian. We were just being ironic. (laughs) No, I just don't open my mouth and let them guess. And we, of course, are here at the world famous Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. Come on into Madhouse to see the nation's top touring comedians live. And if during that time you're tired of laughing about all the comedy, go ahead and check out the website, www.thesciencefaction.com, where we have all of our articles, all of our past episodes, web blogs, and links to all of the stories that we cite here. And with that, let's go right into science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. Article number one, guys. God hates the Saiga. Uh, we learned about Saigas back in May on Science Faction. It's the dick <coughs> face creature, right? The one with it the is. two dicks on its face? It is. The Saiga is a Dr. Seuss-looking antelope in Borat's <laughs> home country that looks like it has two dicks on its face. I mean, that's the easiest way to describe it. it God is, uh, does hate that creature. It looks creature. like a uh, face of a giraffe with two dicks on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a giraffe dick-faced <laughs> antelope. Type thing like a shorter giraffe. Do you think they were banished to Kazakhstan? Like amongst all, like all the other four-legged prey animals, got together and said, "Get the, you know, we we can't look at you. This is, <laughs> we can't raise our children around you." This we, is- we talked about a massive die-off that happened earlier this year in Kazakhstan, in which this species, which only has a few hundred thousand members left living on Earth, had between eighty-five to a hundred thousand suddenly die off in the course of a very short amount of time from unexplained causes. Uh, very, very interesting story. Kind of a sad one, too. We don't want to see this dick face go extinct. Something that I mean, we just... always say Dam- when Damien goes on stage. <laughs> hi oh, That beats my <laughs> joke about porn futures <laughs> on being on the decline because this creature is going extinct. <laughs> well, it has happened again, unfortunately. And this time, 60,000 of the Saiga have died in the same region of Kazakhstan. 
To try and figure out what the cause is of these widespread deaths, researchers have been taking samples from everything the antelope touched over the summer. That means the soil, the water, the vegetation they ate. In addition, they observed the behavior of the animals before they died and took samples from the carcasses. They observed that the females who were in the calving herds were struck first. Next were their calves who were not yet old enough to eat vegetation. So that means that they think if it is something they're ingesting, it would have to be transmittable through the mother's milk because the calves aren't eating their own food yet. Okay, I, I don't know what it is, but is it possible? The males are not affected, correct? I believe the males are affected, I think, on a longer timeline. Okay, well, I was going to say that is it possible that, you know, how everything arrives 40 years later in Kazakhstan? Well, they might be getting the 1980s right now, and maybe all these dudes are like, you know what, I want to be the cool single guy, so I don't want to be locked down into, into fatherhood, raising this damn thing. They just got blue jeans there. Yeah. They're really excited about it. Uh, and basically, they're, I don't know what they're poisoning them with. I don't uh, know what Saiga poisons are. We'd have to talk to a Saiga 2-dick expert. You know what? You're, you bring in an interesting idea, because if they are just getting stuff decades behind us, maybe they're hitting the Rwandan genocide right now, and that's what's <laughs> killing all the Saiga. It's just part of the culture. I don't know if African culture goes like hits in the same <laughs> wave, unless you're referring to Hotel Rwanda, the movie, has just reached. The results of the necropsies or autopsies, showed that the antelope's gut tissue contained toxins that are known to be produced by two types of bacteria. These may have caused bleeding in the animal's organs. However, the researchers aren't completely convinced that these are the toxins responsible. First of all, the bacteria doesn't typically inhabit the saiga antelope and would only have a harmful effect if the animal's immune system were compromised. And that doesn't make sense for large-scale deaths like this. You don't have 60,000 of these animals with compromised immune If these bacteria are the main cause of these deaths, I think these bacteria are run by somebody, like, leadered by somebody like Donald Trump. Because these animals being alive is helping them being alive inside them. Right. So they are probably not looking at the future. If we make these all dead, we, then, then we have no future. Right. That's, that's the whole thing about virulent disease, right? The most virulent disease, the most dangerous ones, aren't the ones that kill you instantly because they kill you too quick for you to spread it. And so then you die too. You're, you're shooting yourself in the foot yeah. like these bastards are. They want to be smart and slowly spread around and just give herpes to everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> But they, they kind of die, like they're just walking, 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 mm -hmm. like in movie Three Hundred. All these people are walking, sure, and then dead. Yeah, <laughs> basically, basically, it seems like that's what's going on. The researchers were smart enough to watch them this time because they knew that big die-off happened earlier in the beginning of the summer. I'm putting my money that it might be the researchers themselves. They're like, listen, <laughs> we, we need to get some grant funds. Kill them. <laughs> yeah, let's kill these big <laughs> animals. <laughs> There's one impotent researcher who's like, but this, you don't get two. <laughs> <laughs> but you got a like a very interesting point. Maybe it's researchers. Maybe it might be the animals themselves. Mm. You, you like you mentioned, it happened two years ago as well. This year, uh, it happened earlier this year. Earlier this year. Mm. You're right. And the only time we talk about this dick faced animal is when they are dead. I didn't even know they existed before <laughs> yeah. they started dying. So maybe they're flying. Oh, they, they are not talking about us. Oh. We have to walk in groups and just fall dead. So maybe the Saiga's real downfall is its desperate need for attention. Yeah. Is that this, they'll mass commit suicide just, just to get people to... So it's a cry for help. You know, you said it, not me, but it makes sense. Another possibility is that it could be a slightly altered environment. The previous winter was unusually cold and spring was especially wet, leading to abundance of vegetation and standing water. Perfect for colonies of bacteria to thrive. This, however, doesn't mean that this is the one cause. We've had wetter springs than this, and we didn't yeah, have we a have. huge diet. Yeah, we have. <laughs> The mysterious deaths of these dick-faced deer continue to taunt scientists and creative porn casting agents alike. Guys, I got a couple of questions for you as my panel. Question number one. What exactly is killing the Saiga? So I will go with my initial thought that I think it's themselves. You think like it's, it's, it's this, is a, this is a cry for attention. <laughs> They're tired of Becky getting the spotlight. <laughs> maybe they are maybe gonna... like it's evolution process. Why do we want to get into it? Maybe they have done enough, you know? Like... Uh, they have uh, like they have uh, faces like giraffes. Mm -hmm. So the stronger and better one have grown taller and became giraffe, and then all these are just done. We are done. Well, okay. How Lamarckian of you? <laughs> Maybe it's yeah. Along that same line, you know, nobody gave a shit about the condor before. There were only like twelve of them. Maybe that's, that's right. their game plan. Let's raise our price in the stock market. Let's oh, go valuable. Rarity breeds value, and so in this case, the less of them there are. Oh, that's even better. And beauty. Their image of themselves as people look at them as these rare things of beauty. You know, like 
right now they're selfless. There's tons of them and they all look like dicks. And there are real people in Africa, right? Real people dying out of hunger. Sure. And they are probably in thousands as well. Right. right. And how how are we disposing all these of these dead saiga? Yeah. I don't. I would imagine in Kazakhstan you don't need to dispose of anything. I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> just let them be There's there. just people that just come and they're like, oh well, this is what happens, you know. <laughs> Finally, dicks. Finally. <laughs> if it's a cremation, then it's going to be a lot of uh, wastage of food. Yeah, absolutely, it would be. <laughs> You speak like an Indian guy. You've already right worked now. it out. You're like, what can I make out of the, all no, these no, dead no, things? Yeah. It, may, it may offend you, I'm, but I'm I was a, just throwing food out of my car on the way here. Uh, I don't eat them. I'm a vegetarian. No, no I'm not a vegetarian. I am, uh, like I would say that I only eat vegetarian animals. Okay. Like, so you don't eat wolves? Do you eat <laughs> no. Vegetative no. animals like animals in a coma, like animals like, that have been no, hit no, by a car. No, animals are eating other vegetables. So, I so what? So there's no animals that you really take out then. <laughs> yeah. The only animals you wouldn't eat would be like pigs, maybe. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, I call myself like a first order vegetarian. Okay. <laughs> like mid-sized fish, you could only eat the bottom of the barrel fish. Yeah, yeah ironically, you couldn't eat fish, which is the thing that all other vegetarians <laughs> eat. <laughs> Question number two: We may be watching the catastrophic extinction of an entire species. What would be your unconventional method? Of saving this species for future generations. Jesus. Oh, you're going to save their souls? That's yeah. how you're going to do it. Listen, I think we need to. We have, we have a great ministry system in America. Problem tons of atheists in America. <laughs> Solution tons of saigas down on their luck, ready to believe anything. Right. That, you know what? You do want to go after a vulnerable population for religion, right? So what more vulnerable population than, hey, remember how your entire, half your population died last year? Come to Jesus. <laughs> I think I will uh, try to convince some of these celebrities to adopt some of these uh, antelopes. Right, so like an Angelina Jolie Angelina saga. Angelina Jolie, yeah. So, <laughs> and get them here and take them to Vegas and show them. Maybe they're dying because it's very... They don't want to live in Kazakh- Kazakhstan. Yeah, maybe yeah. they're like, fuck this Kazakhstan. <laughs> yeah. Let's just... Let, let's, I'll tell you what. Half of us are going to have to bite the bullet and die. <laughs> but the other half are going to get real cushy gigs in zoos. <laughs> There's not going to be enough of us left. I think it, it took, like, it's jokes aside, it would be a really tough problem to figure out yeah. what's causing right. them dead. Because it's not like you have... All of a sudden. There's not, there's not great labs in Kazakhstan. So, like, <laughs> Tell one of these things sodomizes one of Angelina Jolie's kids. I don't really see a, a problem. I don't really see the public's attention being no. focused on it, too. Oh, you guys oh. had, both had very good answers. Uh, I must say both of them were wrong. Uh, <laughs> the correct preservation is, of course, just getting regular deer, duct tape, and extra dicks. <laughs> Where are we going to get the dicks, Bobby? <laughs> oh, I... We will cut Listen. off these dead, dead uh, yes. antelopes. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and I'm not going to say a tasteless Caitlyn Jenner joke like you were trying to get me to do. Well, and these duct tapes can hold anything. Probably <laughs> dicks as well. That's true. They, absolutely. They, they connect vascular systems. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. There is a, there's a little drawing on the side. It's, it, it'll hold dicks. It'll. Oh, it's amazing. I would have thought, you know, how many cows, cows, pigs, whatever, how many livestock go to slaughter each year? You know, maybe hot dogs just take the hit and they just remove the dick from... From <laughs> from them and use them for these for these replacement saiga. Uh, that actually might be another good answer. I'll, I'll have to check if that one works too. <laughs> on okay, to article corrections part next episode. On to article number two, a new way to measure stars' distance that idiot astronomers should have thought of a long time ago. Right now, guys, any idea how we measure stars' distance? We measure them by girth, more importantly, but length is also a concern. <laughs> yeah, it's mainly girth. Girth is a big thing. We use a technique called parallax, in which when we look up at the stars, we can look at the same star from different points on Earth, and then if you imagine basic geometry, you measure the distance between those points of Earth, you measure the angle of that light, and you're able, through basic geometry, to figure out how far away the star is. That's been really useful, except it's got some downfalls. One is, it doesn't work past about 1,000 600 light years. The angle becomes too acute and you can't really get definitive results out of it. We have other methods to measure stars that are further away, but those also have their own accuracy problems. The Kessel Run. Yeah, the Kessel Run usually, uh, though again, if you're doing it in 12 parsecs, that's actually a distance, not a measure of time. That's how they measure distance <laughs> in, the, in a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> So, we needed a way to better measure things, and somehow this method has been sitting in front of scientists for a long time, and their idiot asses didn't figure it out. So this new method is very, very interesting. Researchers from the University of Cambridge examined what are known as stellar twins. Twins? 
<laughs> These are twins that star in Cooler's Light commercials. And they also <laughs> refer to stars that are identical with exactly the same chemical composition, which can be worked out from their spectra. So basically, we can see the light coming off of a star. We can break up the analysts of the light, see what that star is made up of. And based on that, we can see whether or not it's a stellar twin with another star. If they were both placed at the same distance from Earth, so if two stellar twins are at the same distance, they would shine with equal brightness. So the team came to the no-duh realization that if you could just measure one of the stars, basically measuring them from this parallax method, you can tell how far away the other star is just based on its brightness. So this is a much more accurate method than we have to do far away stars, much easier, basic math, very, very simple thing that quite surprisingly, this is one of those things you read about somebody discovering back in like the early 1800s and you're like oh man they were so smart how did they figure this out these guys got this in 2015 (laughs) this is ridiculous it is insane it took them this long but i mean you really can't verify these measurements until you get a guy out there with an extension cord (laughs) yeah yeah uh, he's got one of the little pedometer wheels that they use around construction sites but there might be technology (laughs) there might be one issue with this that the, the atmosphere might not be the same in between earth and that the other star sure so you might have some kind of blockade in yeah, that yeah. stops so, the, so, from the so brightness so even if the star is twin right uh, like he that star will not have the same path you're right there there probably are a couple of those type of things like if you had a dust cloud if you had a nebula yeah. in between it would be hard to to work that out couldn't gravity bend the light uh, <laughs> along the way it, gravity it, of course caused by your fat mama <laughs> Why, why are you going into your mama jokes? Is this because I was insulting the astrophysicist for not figuring this out earlier? Hey, Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> why is your fat mama not figuring this out? But I think let's keep it simple, like just not bending right now. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep it simple, no mom jokes. <laughs> All right, so this easy trick could help us more accurately map out our universe in ways that are previously impossible. A couple of questions for you guys. Number one. How did so many smart people miss such an easy solution for so long? Smart people are lazy. That's true. They are, right? (laughs) Manisha, as a smart person yourself, (laughs) listen, you and I can talk openly (laughs) in front of this dunce. So as smart people, we're usually real lazy, right? We we want to find the quickest, easiest way to achieve something. Maybe these guys... And then let it go for 10 years. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Get get TAs and lab assistants to do most of the work for us, all that kind of stuff. So you think smart... Lazy, why try and fix what's broken? And by the way, if you come up with a really easy, cheap way to measure the distance between stars, mm-hmm. that's less time you're getting paid, right? <laughs> yeah. That's like being a union worker and yeah. then wanting to bring yeah. in some heavy equipment to take yeah. your job away. That's so all you really hope, like guys like Mike Rowe, don't go to community college. That's right. And learn really simple, easy ways to do your job, fixes that you guys haven't thought of. D- dirty jobs for astronomers. <laughs> Damien, what about you? Why do you think these smart people allowed this to get by them for so long? I think it's an academic's arms race. You know, basically, this one guy says, I'm going to study this new type of theoretical math that's going to revolutionize uh, the way we look at stars. Whereas, like, the really simple methods, the really simple, like, maths, like, it's kind of like how fractals were ignored and only discovered in 1970 when it just advanced geometry. Everybody was looking for the next more advanced thing, going deeper uh, yeah, into more yeah, theoretical. I, I, I Fuck think... you guys. You know what? <laughs> No, I think I, I get it. Like uh, sometimes when you're in this research environment, there are simple things in front of you and nobody can look at it. And people are trying to complicate things like a simple example is I am taking a different route to explain the same thing. Like in the space when they were they were inventing a pen that could write in space. Right. But then a kid came and said, uh, and you cannot write using a pen because there is no gravity. Right. So it, and it cannot, it, the fluid cannot mm. go down and stick to the page, yeah. whatever. So they are the kid and told his uh, father who is a nasa scientist who was designing this pen why can't you just use a pencil right so go up there and write with a pencil and after he backhanded the kid what happened (laughs) (laughs) and then he said that uh you know how i pay you by inventing this pen like how i feed you right like and then the father hit the kid Um, (laughs) probably he's an indian father i don't know only then you can do that Thank you for taking what was a failed joke at a comical answer and turning it into something that's a practical lesson for all about child abuse yeah. in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you hit your kid right, your space, sh- space mission is going to be all right. You can steal his idea. And make <laughs> I think that's, a, oh, yeah. I think that's, that's an old joke, Indian. I think. Yeah. <laughs> that's an old Indian saying. If you hit your kid right, he will become an astronaut who develops the right kind of pen. Yeah. Uh, question good. number two. What new insights will we gain with a better idea of the position of stars in our universe? 
I would like to say nothing. You don't think we're going to find anything out? <laughs> nothing about life on other planets or how we're going to travel the stars in a bunch of years or where warp drive's going to – none of that. <laughs> nothing. I, I don't know. Like, there might be something. Like we went to moon and we got something there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, like Mars is okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I do it. But I mean like I hey, get that. But. Hey Mars. Hey Mars. Good news. Manish says you're okay. <laughs> if I was drunk, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's got planet goggles stars, on. That's too far, man. The stars are too that far. Much time. We we probably and wouldn't you, make it there. Yeah, I, I, I don't like. You can imagine like what would be the gas prices up there? Right, and <laughs> and light years. I mean, come on. There might be entire planets of petroleum up there, just right <laughs> next door. Maybe gas prices are really cheap. There's also yeah. giant balls of gas called hydrogen that are stars, you know. But those would work as well. <laughs> yeah, but Mike Rowe's not doing that dirty job. <laughs> what about you? Do but, I need a visa to be on that star? N- not at all. <laughs> You can okay. you can marry an American and go anywhere you want. <laughs> <laughs> Our citizenship is supreme. It's really just the tits. It's David. What about you? What new insights do you think we'll gain when we get a better idea of the position of stars in our universe? I think we need to get a better knowledge of the position of stars, so that we can get a better knowledge of the position of asteroids. So that and while Bruce Willis is still alive. This is something theoretically possible. So you want to be, you want it more as an early warning system of when Armageddon, when that asteroid is coming to blow us all up, so that we still have Willis around. We've already lost Michael Clark Duncan. How many more <laughs> actors from Armageddon do we have That's to lose true. before? As, a, as as scientists, we should have probably said that. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and, and let me just say. Michael Clark Duncan, he can be replaced by most NFL linemen in that particular role. Bruce Willis, once we lose him, we're all dead if the asteroid comes. By the way, they really didn't get into the backstory. Of all blue-collar jobs I've ever been on, there are some huge racists there. Do you think Michael Clark Duncan just worked out all the time to be like the one black guy that none of the white guys said anything about? That's right. (laughs) Don't call him the (laughs) N-word. We're on an oil rig. This is not U.S. soil. There is no cops. (laughs) No cops here. No one will stop him. Question number three. What is the next simple and inexplicably overlooked discovery that will change the way science is performed? When it's discovered with proper training that chimpanzees can take over most lab tech positions. <laughs> oh, yeah. We've been – we just like we're wasting time doing parallax for every single star, we're wasting time using human beings as lab assistants instead of chimps. They've grown up their whole lives in this lab. Right. Nobody knows that lab better. And that's all they know. So they're not they have no home to go to. You don't have to worry about them having families or like love or anything else in their life. They're just abused chimps. Yeah, just threaten them with that life outside the lab and they shit themselves, literally. And then throw it at the chimp that offended them. <laughs> Let's move right on to our interview with Manish. All right, Manish, so you are one of the rare ones, as we discussed before, who is both a scientist and a comedian like myself. It's tough work, huh? I uh it, it's like a drug. I yeah. Would say. And you, uh, do you work science into your comedy? Are you, do you consider yourself a science comedian? Uh, not really. I have like a couple of jokes which Good, are stay more... the fuck out of my voice. <laughs> there are a couple of jokes which are a bit mathy or something uh-huh. like that. Have you thought about starting a podcast just about a science <laughs> comedy podcast? Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Like a science comedy podcast where you just come in and take a story. Like a lot of weird stuff happening really, in science. <laughs> really successful, yeah. probably in India. Yeah, I mean, the hits yeah. we'd get out of India alone yeah, would yeah. be... Yeah, they would be super awesome. And the <laughs> kind of access that I have to my one billion people up there. Yeah, that's right. You do. You have all, you have all access to this whole other market. You'd yeah. be the Russell so, Peters of science comedy. <laughs> so you're more of just a regular comedian who also happens to be a scientist on the side. Yeah. And but I think it helps. It helps mm-hmm. being uh, like a scientist comedian. Um, for like, like, I think like science is just logic. You right. Know? And comedy is like you're just twisting that logic. So it's kind of the same thing. Like when uh, something makes you laugh, you just twist it. And when the audience untwist it back, they get the laugh out of it. So, so I think it's kind of the same thing. Most like very, very, very good comedians are smart people. I'm not saying I'm smart. I'm just Indian. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're born with an MD. Yeah, yeah. that says it for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we brought up that you're a scientist as well. You do some research at UCSD. Yes, yes, what, yeah. what is your particular area of expertise? So I go to UCSD. I'm uh, doing uh, like I'm pursuing my PhD in computer science, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm doing research in this uh, area which is called uh, like variability or hardware errors. Like these computers, like when there is an error in the hardware, right? Or sometimes when you open your computer, you see a blue screen of death. Right. So my job is that you don't see that blue screen of death. Okay. It will show you something 
like not blue, maybe red. Porn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's so computer science has always interested me. I've taken a few coding classes and uh I realized it wasn't for me, but but what's always super interesting to me is the definitive logic of computer situations. Because the world is fluid. There's a lot of things that come into your everyday life in the world that push left or push right and ruin plans and you can't always it's not always F that, equals M A in the yeah, real world. You got like yeah, you you like you said a very right point. That's exactly what my research is. Like we like right now computers are very rigid, mm -hmm. right? We say that one plus one is <laughs> equal to two. Right. Like it always have to be two. Uh, but it might not be too like there might be some errors into it or like human beings we adapt as we go so similarly like if a uh, computer is aging with time uh, then your upper layers layer, your software can adapt it right. can adapt with that situation like a simple example for that would be you're watching a match between Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal and it's a Wimbledon match so most of the pixel on your screen are green and because of some fluid thing that you're talking about there are some errors creeping in in transmission or wherever and some of these pixels are are not right you don't have those pixel information so you can just copy the pixel information the ne the the neighborhood information right. and most likely that would be green and the user will not be able to detect that there was some until it goes over the line <laughs> the yeah, white line and, and that's green too screen. yeah very, very interesting. So what about science in general? Uh, what is your interest, broader interest in science, and what brought you to those? Um, I think just logically answering any question, uh, that was it. And, uh, like, I loved physics growing up, uh, mm -hmm. all that basic physics, uh, motion, dynamics, and all that stuff. So that got me into it. And then uh, I wrote an exam, did engineering, and I am glad I was good in science because <laughs> in India, these are the two options that you go, go like these, they, like we have a template life, you're either doctor or an engineer and figure out <laughs> later what you want to do. And I'm glad that I was good at it. Right. And I made it, made it this far. How long have you been in the States? Five years. Wow, yeah. that's really good. Yeah. I don't sound like I've been here for five years, right? No, no, no. You, listen, if you can get up on stage and actually do comedy in a mm -hmm. language that is not your first language, to me, that blows my mind. Because okay. I, have, I have dabbled in other languages. I can kind of uh, be semi-fluent in some of them. I could never imagine going on stage, flowing, telling jokes, working crowd work, especially. I don't do much crowd work. Really? Uh, sometimes, only when I'm feeling uh, uh, super Randy, good. drunk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take a step back. You're talking about computers that adapt and learn. Can you say, are you willing to come out on air and say that you're working on Skynet? <laughs> Maybe. Is that reference lost? Is, is it Skynet? It's kind of lost. It's kind of lost. I'm just playing Joey from Friends. You know, you know what? Uh, that's what somebody who was working on Skynet would say. <laughs> that's absolutely true. He would lie. He would, Skynet he would. was the computer that destroyed humanity in Terminator. Oh. Like eventually, when you, eventually oh, when you get I to the works of James movie, Cameron. But I don't remember that reference, Skynet. You were too busy designing it. <laughs> uh, Manish, what do you think is the future for you in terms of science? Where do you hope to go with it? You are obviously pursuing an advanced degree in computer science. Uh, you're also doing things like stand-up comedy and, and bringing elements of science into that. Mm -hmm. What is your end game? What is your goal when it comes to science? When it comes to science, just keep working. I love uh, coding and programming and keep working on my research and try to get something out of there. And then probably just, uh, like there are two paths that you can take. You can either go to academia or you mm -hmm. can go to industry. Uh, uh, when I came in, I wanted to go to academia, but no more. <laughs> now you want money. <laughs> <laughs> I will go to industry, and I will work there, and I will keep working on my comedy. And probably I would like to stay in San Diego because this place has spoiled me. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Between I, the weather and the women, yeah, right? Yeah. Dudes are nice, too, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. All right, guys. Let's move right on to I Call BS. I Call BS. I Call I Call I Call I Call I Call Ring, ring. I Call BS. Okay, I Call BS is the game in which I give my panelists four science articles, some of which are real and some of which are BS, standing for bad science, and they try and guess which is which. Are you guys ready to play? Oh, Joe, yes. I'm coming off a loss last week. <laughs> That's hard... two losses. Two losses no, in a, a row. a tie and a loss, Two you ass. losses in a row. So All you right. keep a count. Yeah. Oh, oh, God. That's because... You're a nerd, man. Well, there were... <laughs> How dare all of you? <laughs> Says the computer science PhD student. Burn! All right. Article number one. 
The Ocean Cleanup, a nonprofit organization, intends to clean the ocean of plastic by putting a 62 mile net up in the Pacific Ocean between California and Hawaii and let the currents do all the work. Article number two. Scientists have discovered a way to use discarded tea bags to capture carbon and prevent global warming. Article number three. The first European outbreak of polio in the last five years has left two children paralyzed. And article number four. New research suggests that simply ingesting vitamin C can give some of the same cardiovascular benefits as exercise. Since Damien, even though he's on a losing streak, is our reigning champion, we'll go ahead and let him go first. Damien, article number one, the Ocean Cleanup, a nonprofit organization, intends to clean the ocean of plastic by putting a 62-mile net up between California and Hawaii and let the currents do all the work. Is this science or bad science? This is science. Ever since uh, scientist Barry White took over the program and nicknamed it the Motion in the Ocean program. I heard people complain. They're like, the Pacific Ocean is too big. And he had to explain to them, it's not the size of the ocean. It is the motion of the ocean. Yeah, He came in basically just with the name and just said, design the project around this. Their goal is to use the And you know what? It turned out pretty well. This, thing could, this program could have gone disastrously. And Manish, do you think this is real or How bad How big science? is the filter? 62 mile net. 62 mile. And... Which side are they cleaning? It depends on the current, right? I would guess so, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so are they cleaning Hawaii or are they cleaning California? <laughs> I think the idea is they clean the entire Pacific. Like if, if, like if this is the filter and it goes like this side, then right. the plastic is trapped here. Right. But if the current direction changes, then it goes back. Oh, uh, <laughs> so you're thinking of too small a world, Manish. You don't realize that that water is going to come back around at some point and be back in that current stream going through the right way of the filter. But I think this seems to me like science. So both of you think this is true. Article number two, scientists have discovered a way to use discarded tea bags to capture carbon and prevent global warming. Damien, is this science or bad science? This was a discovery out of China, and it was bad science. It was not tea. It was pee-pee and coke. Well, you you went you skipped one easy joke and went, went to a different, <laughs> more racist, joke. more racist. Yeah, yeah. You actually you you forced racism <laughs> in a joke that was otherwise amber racist. All right, and Manish, what do you think? Uh, usually, teabagging causes a lot of environmental changes. <laughs> 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 That's true uh, and emotional, but uh, uh, it's a bad signs. All right. Can I uh, ask time out from the game and uh, just ask Manish, is there a word in India for teabagging as in the – is there an act? <laughs> would you just – just, is that just such an insane I mean, you guys thing were, to do to somebody? You were a British colony. You yeah. think out of anybody, you guys would have <laughs> a more recent British colony even than us. You think you would have a word for teabag as well. Uh, I'm pretty sure there must be a word, but I think we have a painting for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so we just show that painting, and we don't say a word. I so walked you on the just, guy just comes card. home, and then he says, "Like comes with a painting." You have read about the Kama Sutra. Of course, right? yeah. So there is no word exchange. Hey, tonight just... is going to be this. <laughs> <laughs> Your shit talking must be just more visual. Yeah, yeah. All right, and we uh, have to keep it quiet. You know, we live in a lot of joint families. Oh, there's a billion of you. Yeah. <laughs> You're kind of cramped in there. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. You can't teabag a guy who lives under the same roof as you. He's getting you back. You got to go to sleep at some time. Yeah. You got to teabag yeah. one of the dudes from the other house. I got gotcha. you. Article number three: The first European outbreak of polio in the last five years has left two children paralyzed. Damien, is this science or bad science? Correct, but to be fair, Conor McGregor has named his fist polio, and those children shouldn't have been in his fucking dressing room. <laughs> okay, so the Irish UFC fighter Conor McGregor has paralyzed two children by beating, for some reason, beating them senseless. <laughs> to quote, he, he thought they were little Chinamen. <laughs> so he, he, he beat them senselessly. If, 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 it's, if, if it's true, it's probably misdiagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the real, the real uh, villain here isn't even McGregor. It's the physician. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was really offensive when he asked for polio signatures. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Manish? Do you think the first European outbreak of polio in the last five years has left two children paralyzed? I don't think it's science. Because it's European. Because they're European. They should be better than us, right? Bunch of whiteies. And uh, Europeans, polio. I think they eradicated polio long back. I think uh, they would too. And article number four. New research suggests that simply ingesting vitamin C can give some of the same cardiovascular benefits as exercise. Damien, is this science or bad science? 
This is bad science. I feel like if that wasn't the case, we'd hear about a lot more pirates complaining about bad hearts than bad gums from not having their vitamin C. Oh, yeah, that's right. So instead of getting scurvy and having their teeth fall out, they'd be like, Arr, me heart. Uh, Arr, chest pain. Arr, angina. <laughs> and what about you, Manish? If it's a good science, it's probably coming out of a research group run by Chris Christie. Okay, yeah, so the governor of New Jersey, <laughs> yeah. he's trying to get it in. You're yeah, saying it's yeah. true, but it's it's only true because Christie is the one pushing it. He's yeah. been eating a lot of Orange Julius and, recently. And, and if, it, if, it's, if it's true, aren't uh, some of these uh, white bitches in America already doing it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all please repeat your feminist that. comment one more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, so, what do they do? What, are, they, are, are there they're a lot of white? injecting all these pills and everything. Oh, okay. Just... So, they're get, they're, you think there's a little bit of vitamin C in there that yeah, they're getting yeah, as well? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Let's see. <laughs> let's see how our surprisingly racist group did when we look back. <laughs> Article number one, the Ocean Cleanup, a nonprofit organization, intends to clean the ocean of plastic by putting a 62-mile net up in the Pacific Ocean between California and Hawaii and letting the currents do all the work. Both of you thought this one was true, and this one is science. It's a V-shaped net that they're putting up. They've tried it out off the coast of Japan, and the V pushes the big plastic towards the center, so much so that you can actually walk on the surface of the garbage. Once the garbage is concentrated, vessels can come pick it up and take it for recycling, which is way more efficient than trolling around the ocean in a ship trying to pick up the plastic where it is. Because all of the ocean essentially goes through certain points because of currents, you can just have a stationary thing there, filter everything out that way. Then you're not ironically using more greenhouse gases in the fuel of boats to go out and get the trash. Did Japan only agree to this if they got to keep any whales that would yeah. end up in the filter? <laughs> they said as long as we get – and by the way, we got to get to them before they die of natural causes because we <laughs> love killing whales. Uh, article number two, scientists have discovered a way to use discarded tea bags to capture carbon and prevent global warming. Both of you thought this one was false, and this one is bad science. It's actually coffee grounds that they're using to capture methane. Uh, we would have said false to that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. I don't, I don't see an Asian joke in that. <laughs> Scientists have developed a simple process to treat waste coffee grounds to allow them to store methane. And the simple soak and heating process develops a carbon capture material with the additional environmental benefits of recycling a waste product. We all know that methane can be up to 25 times as damaging of a greenhouse gas as carbon, as CO2. So this is huge because being able to capture methane is a really big thing, especially for industrial ranching and farming applications like large dairy farms with a whole lot of cows. They put out a lot of methane. That's That really contributes to global warming. Turns out, shove some coffee grounds up their ass and we might have something here. Yeah, so the coffee enema is actually coming yeah. into play. It's it just... might be scientific. All right. Article number three. The first European outbreak of polio in the last five years has left two children paralyzed. Damien thinks this is true. Manish thinks this is bad science. And this one is... Science. You were almost right. You were almost right, uh, Manish, because it happened in the Ukraine, okay. uh, where vaccination and English accents are spotty. First case since a small breakout in Russia in 2010, which was the last case in Europe, in the European part of Russia, which is probably why Russia wants the Ukraine so badly. They've missed their polio fix for the last five years. <laughs> By the way, poor Europe. You know, it has this large, pretty successful vaccination program, pretty good job, like you said, at eradicating polio. Mm -hmm. And then Russia and its bastard child, the Ukraine, have to come in and ruin their record for the past 10 years. When they knew there'd be complications and they adopted the bastard child of Russia, but... <laughs> All right, and lastly, new research suggests that simply ingesting vitamin C can give some of the same cardiovascular benefits as exercise. Damien thinks this is false, Manish thinks this is true, and this one is... Science! Yeah. Tie. <laughs> tie, and the tie, of course, always goes to our guest host, meaning Damien lost once again what? in a what? shameful, oh, this is different. <laughs> shameful display of inaccuracy and incompetence <laughs> that, quite frankly, I'm embarrassed for you to have to witness, Manish. You just made an enemy for life, Manish. <laughs> this is indeed a true story. The blood vessels of overweight and obese adults have elevated activity of the small vessel constricting protein. ET1. Yes, it is ET1. That okay. is the name. Excellent. Did it get to find its way home? I love white bitches. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I love Damien. Uh, That's bec- the end of that insult. <laughs> because of the high ET1 activity, these vessels are more prone to constricting, becoming less responsive to blood flow demand, and increasing the risk of developing vascular disease. Exercise has been shown to reduce ET1 activity, and this study showed that vitamin C can do the same thing, and that can improve cardiovascular health. It can help delay certain effects and can probably actually prevent certain kinds of cardiac arrests and heart attacks, as well as other cardiovascular disease. Now all we need is the pill that makes you not morbidly obese, and we've got it all down. We can just keep (laughs) eating whatever we want. I think all these gym owners and like buff guys would be so pissed with this. Oh nose. yeah, can't can't you see like the own, owner of Bally's Total Fitness just smashing oranges in the, in the grocery <laughs> store? <laughs> Screw you guys! <laughs> he just starts poisoning orange juice supplies to try and give it a bad rep. I thought it'd be like casualties of war. Like Squirt has to put on its bottle. Yeah. Like no vitamin C is anywhere <laughs> in this can, please. <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, congratulations, Manish, in demolishing Damien in an embarrassing, embarrassing whipping. My was, mom. That was out into the backyard behind the shed, whipping like the 1940s. You would have gotten arrested for doing to a child what you just did to Damien in this game. You, you beat him so badly. You. Not mom, in his home country, though. <laughs> As he made clear. <laughs> but my mom in my home country must be so proud of me. Oh, <laughs> Especially when you show the size difference between you two. I mean, she's going to be really impressed. Yeah. Physically, it was a David versus Goliath <laughs> situation but that happened. All right, guys, let's move right on to our final bit. Hey, science, listen up. Hey, science, listen up. Hello out there, drug company shills and podcast savvy sheeple. Welcome to my corner of the show where big science's non-lucrative sleeper hold is violently reversed, followed by a mean figure four leg lock. Today's topic, the anti-vaxxing heroes among us, or social media's crystal knot, the anti-vaxxer tragedy. So you consider yourself a hero being an anti-vaxxer, who, which undoubtedly will cause the deaths of children needlessly. Yes, I'm, well, I'm a hero for standing up for the rights of parents to, to, to question Big Pharma's stranglehold on, on what clearly is science consensus. Okay, all right, let's hear it. Okay, so I, I have some questions. I'm going to demand some answers and reverse some of the brainwashing done by Big Pharma here, Big University, and, of course, Big Boy from Outcast. <laughs> Question number one, answer me this, science man. Historically... Recommended vaccines have been shown to harm children, and not just vaccines either. Let us remember some of Big Pharma's failures. The original polio vaccine gave some kids polio. Thalidomide was a below-average morning sickness medication. (laughs) Thalidomide, which, by the way, was rejected from being used in the the U.S. because of science, right? So science is what kept thalidomide out, which gave a bunch of pregnant women who took it in Europe had children that had, like, flippers and stuff like that. I didn't interrupt your shit-talking of me uh, after after I tied Manish over here. (laughs) No, don't get me wrong. After that brutal loss, you did sit there and cry like you would be expected to. Yes. Below average morning sickness medication and, of course, children's Viagra. (laughs) Why would today recommendations be any different? Why should we trust the villain with the poison needle? Well, I would say, just just playing devil's advocate here, uh, that a lot of those mistakes you mentioned still were better than the alternative. Early polio vaccines still prevented polio. That's still good. Morning sickness still exists. Explain the the thalidomide. (laughs) We don't want to use thalidomide. It gives babies flippers, which <laughs> arguably could be useful in some occasions, but probably not something you want for your kids. With how acidic the oceans are becoming, that's not an option anymore. Well, actually, with global warming, as, as you know, the oceans rise, flippers might be a good, you know, you might have aquatic people. Thalidomide equals a ad- selective advantage in water world. You know what? Normally I'm against you in this. I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, you're bringing me onto your side. <laughs> All right, so why should we trust the guy with the poison needle? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that that guy with that poison needle has a needle that's not poison. In fact, it's going to help you out. He's done a lot of research. He's much smarter than you, and he's probably got your best interest in mind. All right, pretending that people believe what Bobby had to say, let's go on to question number two. The naturalnews.com article was very clear. Vaccines are like alcoholic beverages. It's very dangerous for little babies to get so many all at one time. (laughs) Their immune system slash chugging abilities can get overwhelmed. (laughs) So I guess my question is two-part. One, why don't babies' immune systems ball so hard? And two, legally, could a fraternity adopt a baby? Uh, To address number two, yes, it's happened. And they've created a whole line of products just for the common occurrence of babies in fraternities. There's baby beer bong, (laughs) which has a nipple on the the bottom. (laughs) Several Van Wilder sequels. 
they actually have baby based condoms, uh, which ironically are larger. I don't know why. (laughs) (laughs) It's comically so. And of course. uh, Because they cover the whole baby. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You don't want diseases getting on this baby. And if it wasn't for babies and fraternities, we would have never developed crotchless diapers. (laughs) (laughs) What about my first question? Why don't babies' immune systems ball so hard? Can't I give my child so many vaccinations so young? Uh, well, one, uh, babies' immune systems, they do rebound. The, the vaccines are not a problem for them. They're, they're totally able to take them. There's no issues there. Uh, but they are a little bit of lightweights when it comes to drinking. And one of the reasons is, is mind over matter. If you think your baby can't drink, your baby can't drink. Absolutely. <laughs> right? But you know what? It takes a guided, definitive... Uh, encouraging and quite frankly uh, successful parent to put that beer bottle in that baby's hand or bottle to get them to get them going and you know as long as you have the the idea they're not going to be able to take you know five or six shots and go out with me uh, to the bars and drink a little bit more. I think Irish baby will do very good. Yeah, McGregor's baby. <laughs> they are. Oh, Conor Maybe McGregor's baby will be paralyzing kids at a oh, fifth grade level. Oh, today mom is going to take me to get me vaccine. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why Conor McGregor beat up those two kids and gave the, and, and paralyzed them. Uh, he was drinking with his baby <laughs> and got into a bar brawl. Oh. His baby paralyzed one of the kids. Got into a Chuck E. Cheese brawl. <laughs> Dear doc, you gave to this but What about this one? I don't want this one to be bigger than this one. (laughs) All right, fair enough. You've answered my question. But I have one last one. Jenny McCarthy has taken a lot of unfair criticism for bravely stating what we all know to be true about the link between autism and vaccines. Convince me that I'm wrong to equate physical attractiveness with intelligence. How is Jenny McCarthy not an idiot for saying that? Well, first of all, you're not wrong. Because those of us who are both physically attractive and intelligent appreciate the fact that you view that link. Good job on that. <laughs> Here's the problem with Jenny McCarthy. Jenny is, is hated not just for this, which she is wrong on. She's wrong about the whole autism vaccine link. But she's really hated because back in the 1950s, she went after anybody who even would seem to have communist sympathies. And in doing so, <laughs> essentially ostracized whole groups of people who then later were just eager to hate her when she came back with this. So, and that's how McCarthyism became a thing that influenced government politics. So, so, I think people didn't like her as well because, I mean, how many young relationships on Single Doubt did she just kind of mock <laughs> and, like, and like have that's a very right. dismissive tone? Like, they weren't going to get married. That wasn't marriage wasn't going to last. Now, I've heard your answer. Keeping in mind that our audience knows that you, Bobby, are both vaccinated and mildly <laughs> autistic. True. Bobby, how can we trust that you aren't some sort of logically, socially awkward zombie trying to propagate your condition upon our nation's youth? As I've discussed, because we've actually got, that's a good question. We've discussed this before. If you could genetically influence autism, because we know autism is a genetic disease. Mm -hmm. If you could do embryotic tests and be able to either through gene therapy or selective abortion, whatever, keep autism from propagating by by curing it for people, would that be considered a genocide of the autistic community? Because there are people in the genetic deaf community who feel that way. They think you can't take away genetic deafness, you're doing a genocide on our community. And my argument is that would never be the case for the autistic community because we are way too fucking logical. (laughs) We are like, we're like, fuck this. This is no good. There would be no more Oscar nominated movies. (laughs) That's right. So you think Temple Grandland would want somebody else to go? You think you should want her daughter to be Temple Grandland? (laughs) That is why we're too logical. We would logically see that not being autistic is better and try as hard as possible to keep people from being autistic. Last question. Does Donnie Wahlberg have it all? Yes. (laughs) I'm done. That's the end of my bit. So I think, like, uh, we should not vaccinate good-looking babies. I mean, like, for how... Oh, (laughs) so then they die more... Is now is that just because you are attracted to good-looking baby corpses, <laughs> so, <laughs> Manish? You are a man of shorter stature. <laughs> no. uh, like I'm saying this because I'm jealous of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's some parent like talking to Doctor Manish? Please, she'll grow into that face. Please, she'll, she'll she'll have inner beauty. Please give my daughter the polio vaccine. All right, guys. Thank you, Manish, for joining us Thank on so this week's Science me. Faction. Thanks all the listeners for uh, tuning in. And, of course, as always, please tune in next week for Science Faction 87. So you told me we get white bitches after this? You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. So you're a nerd, man.